welcome. We're starting this week on a new sermon series. We're going to look at, through the Easter season, some of the I am statements that Jesus made in the Bible. And there's a bunch of them. We're not going to be able to cover all of them. We'll take one each week. But uh, we're going to look at one of them coming out of John 15, 5 today, where Jesus says, I am the vine. And uh, we're going to dig into that a little bit and see what that might mean. Now, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. We have Bibles at our Welcome Center you can take home and have for your very own. Otherwise, there's a few in the chairs in front of you, or you can use a digital Bible. version is a good one if you've got an iPhone or Android or iPad or something. Uh, feel free to look up John uh, 15, 1 through 8 is where we're really going to be most of the day, but John 15, 5 specifically. And uh, that's where we're going to camp out, so feel free to follow along. But uh, to kick things off, just a little information. There, there's in Hampton Court near London... Um, in, in that area, there, there's, a, there's a grapevine that is documented at being over a thousand years old. So it's hard to imagine that, but a grapevine that's a thousand year old. And, and, and this grapevine has one enormous root uh, that goes into the trunk, and it's at least two feet in diameter, which is, if you've seen grapevines, that's astonishingly large. And despite the age of this vine, it produces several tons of grapes each and every year. Um, so it's a pretty amazing vine. And although some, some branches on it are small, parts of it extend over 200 feet away from that very small, or that very large base there. And, and, and it apparently has just absolutely sweet and delicious fruit. And, and it grows these all the way out 200 feet away because it's connected to the vine. The life of that entire plant flows from that single root through that single trunk. And that vine brings out nourishment to the very ends and adds strength to each and every one of its branches, growing new branches each and every year. Now, as we look at that in a spiritual sense, Jesus promises to do the very same for us. Jesus tells us that he is the true vine, bringing life to each one of his branches. Now, the purpose of a vine is to bring nourishment to the branches in order that they might produce fruit. When separated from the vine, the branches die, right? So the vitality of our spiritual life is dependent upon our connection with Christ, the true vine. Now this morning, each of us is going to have to answer two questions. First is, are we connected to that vine? Or to put it another way, is the life of Christ flowing through me? And then secondly, if we are connected... If we are connected to that vine, are we joined to Christ in that way? Then if so, how much fruit are we producing through our lives? Is there no fruit? Is there some fruit? Or is there an abundance of fruit? Now John 15, as I was mentioning, verses 1 through 8 says this. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves To be my disciples. If you're taking notes, the very first note there is that Jesus is the source of life. Jesus tells his disciples, he says, I am the true vine. Have you ever read this and wondered why did Jesus say this? Now, now, as I've studied this, I, I, I do think I know why. Think with me for a little moment about the storyline, the timeline of what's happening in the story in the life of Jesus, and where Jesus and his disciples most likely are at this point in the story. Now, if you, if, if you remember from previous years or growing up as a child, that, that the night in which Jesus was betrayed, all of this stuff that we're going to be learning about 
happens as, as Jesus and his disciples have just been in the upper room. See, Jesus in the storyline, right before this portion of Scripture, Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room. They had just celebrated the Passover in that upper room. Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, right? And he had spoken with them about about events that were about to take place. And now after a a great deal of discussion, he, he, he and his disciples ends that evening, and Jesus says, Come now, let us leave. We see that in in chapter 14, right before this. So, so they're leaving, they're proceeding out, they're, they're going from this upper room in this night of celebration to the Passover. And then Matthew, one of the other disciples uh, who was following Jesus, who was at that Passover meal with Jesus, um, he, 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 if we read his accounting in Matthew 26, we see the disciples sing a hymn, and then they go out to the Mount of Olives. And I believe it was as they are making their way up to the Mount of Olives, as they're going from this upper room Uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus, as he's walking along with the men there, he he continues to instruct this group who had been walking with him for the last three years. And Jesus Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what was happening that night and in the days to come. And he knew knew his time was beginning to run out. But he still knew he had much to tell them, much to share with the disciples. And so then when we come into John 15, Jesus continues with his teaching. And he says, I am the true vine. And, and, and you need to know, Jesus was a master teacher. See, he didn't talk over people's heads. He, he used common illustrations, things that they would understand. He taught in such a way that, that people could grasp his teaching. And so I believe that as, as Jesus and his disciples were making their way, they're walking along, all of a sudden he sees something that's familiar. Something that would have been familiar to anyone who lived in Jerusalem. They see this grapevine, maybe right on the side of the road there, out grown from somebody's garden perhaps. And in this way then, then Jesus can walk up to the vine and he tells his disciples, I am the true vine. And in that moment I can just imagine how he had their attention. Jesus was using something familiar to them and they could understand this illustration. In the upper room, Jesus had told his disciples some things that that, that were difficult for them to understand, but now Jesus could help them comprehend what he had told them. And and two things as he tells us, he stand out from what Jesus tells his disciples there in the upper room in John 14. And and the first one is that, that Jesus told his disciples, if you remember John 14, he says, I am the life, right? In John 14, 6. And the second thing that Jesus tells his disciples, he says, hey guys, um... This Holy Spirit is going to come to you, right? John fourteen sixteen through 18. And, and they didn't quite understand all of this in the upper room. And so, so Jesus is beginning to clarify this upper room teaching with an illustration that, that they could all understand when he says, I am the true vine. Anyone who, who lived in Jerusalem at this time, even, even these, some of these guys who were rough fishermen who were followers of Jesus, Even those among the twelve who grew up mostly in a boat, they still knew that life flowed from the vine out into the branches, right? They understood the mechanics of that. And so Jesus uses this common sight uh, that you could find just about anywhere around in Jerusalem to bring further understanding to what he had said earlier. And in doing this, Jesus is, is showing his disciples, and he's showing us, that He is the source of spiritual life. Jesus is the source of life, a resource made available to us by the Holy Spirit when He comes to dwell within us as believers. John spells this out very clearly for us, very plainly in 1 John 5, um, 11 through 12. He says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this is life in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now before we move any further, I want to stop and deal with that first question. Uh, The question I asked, are are we connected to the vine? If, If you're not connected to the vine, if you're not connected to Jesus through the forgiveness of your sin... If you've not let Jesus rescue you from drowning in in the turbulent sea of your sin, 
the Bible makes it clear you're as good as dead. That the, the life that you are living is, is empty and it's, it's meaningless because you aren't connected to the source of life. We, we read this, in, and in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, the choice is yours. If you're not connected to the vine, you can, you can stay the way you are, or you can choose to be grafted into the, the living, life-giving vine. All other vines are lifeless. The branches have no real fruit because there's no life in the vine. But when you are connected to Jesus, when you are grafted into His life, into His family, suddenly everything will be made new and come alive for you. Now the second point is the life source produces fruit. See, Jesus is the life source. And, and His life within us as believers, if we have been grafted into His family, His life for us as believers is one of purpose. And it's for us to produce fruit. And the question we need to think about for ourselves, if we are grafted to that vine of Jesus, is how much fruit is being produced? How much am I producing? Is there no fruit? Some fruit, or is there an abundance of fruit? Now remember, Jesus is talking with his disciples, right? And Jesus is the true vine, and his disciples, and those who believe in him, are the branches. So when we think about the quantity of fruit in an individual's life, we're talking about believers at this point. Those who are connected to the vine. And and as we said Anyone who is not connected to Jesus, you can't bear fruit. If you're not connected to the vine, there's, there's nothing to grow. You don't have any roots. There's nothing to give you the nourishment that you need. But if you are connected, the question is, how much fruit is being produced in your life? Now, this fruit doesn't have to do with your salvation. If you've, if you've been saved, you've already been incorporated into that family. You've been connected to the vine. That is an ongoing thing. But still, we have to deal with this idea, are we producing fruit? And the quantity of fruit that we we produce deals with the issue of what you are doing with the life source that God has planted within you. Now before we deal with that question, let's quickly think about the fruit itself. Some of you may be wondering, okay, well... I'm part of that vine, right? I'm connected, but what is what, what, Pastor? What specifically is the fruit that we should be producing, right? Now, some have taught that the the fruit of Jesus is talking about obedience, and, and that fits within the the context of of those who love Christ. But if you love Christ, you'll you'll obey His commands, right? Others have taught the fruit is is to reproduce other believers, right? To make disciples. One of the signs of life is that it reproduces itself. That's a basic fundamental science thing. Fruit carries within it the seed that has the ability to reproduce. Now others have taught that that the fruit is those things that are the fruit of the Spirit that we've heard of many times if you've grown up in the church, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Those are the things that, that, are, that are fruitful evidence that you are connected to the vine. So, so which, which one, which is it, right? Well, let's, let's let Jesus maybe answer that question. Matthew 7, 16 through 18 says this. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So Jesus is saying that we will recognize the fruit, that, so to speak, we're fruit inspectors. Did you know that? You're a fruit inspector. You're all a little bit fruity. You can quote me on that. But let's check out the fruit, right? Is obedience to Christ's word something 
that, that the life of Christ would reproduce into the believer, right? Well, yeah, certainly. So, so yes, the answer is yes. Is, is reproduction of new believers something that, that Jesus' life within you would yield as a fruit? Well, again, the answer to that is yes, of course it is. And then, are, are the fruits of the Spirit a, a byproduct of Christ's life working within a believer? And again, I think we have to say, yeah, absolutely. So what is the fruit of the believer's life that is connected to Jesus, the, the, the true life-giving vine? Well, it's all of the above. It's not just one. It's not just obedience. It's not just the fruit of the Spirit. It's not, it, it's not just making disciples. It's all of those, right? Those who are in Christ's branches should desire to produce more and more and more of all of His fruits. And then that brings us to the question of quantity. How much fruit does your life produce? No fruit, some fruit, or an abundance? A lot. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the, the branches that produce no fruit. Does it surprise you that there could be branches that are connected to a vine that produce no fruit? If you grew up farming, you, you might understand that. And, and I believe Jesus identifies two such branches. On the surface, we might think they should receive the same treatment by the gardener. Uh, the, the fruit branch that is cut off and thrown into the fire, right? It's like, ooh, okay. I mean, look at me and hear what Jesus says here in, in John 15, 2 and 6. It says that he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. And if he does not remain in me... He's like a branch that is thrown away and withers and such branches are picked up and they're thrown into the fire and they're burned. Okay. Are these the same kind of branches as believers who don't have fruit? There's some believers that are part of the vine that aren't producing fruit, but there's other branches that aren't producing fruit. Are these the same kinds of branches, Pastor? But there's a difference between the two. In verse 2, Jesus says, the branch in me. But in verse 6, he says, the branch does not remain in me. See, a healthy grapevine, it puts out new shoots which grow into branches. But sometimes those branches grow along the ground. You ever been to a vineyard? You've seen some of these. And what happens is, as they grow around, along the ground, sometimes they get covered by dirt. And because they're shaded, they don't produce any leaves, they don't produce any fruit. They're alive, but they can't produce fruit. So what happens then is the gardener comes through and he'll, he'll find these roots and he can pull them up out of the dirt and he can brush them off and wash them off and then he can hang them up on the trellis. And as they begin to see the light, as they begin to get the light, the light that they need from the sun being cleaned, and lift it up, they begin to grow and produce fruit. The fruitless branch in verse 2 is kind of like that, that believer who has not been discipled or, or trained in, in, in the Christian life. Maybe a new Christian, or maybe just a, somebody who made a commitment to Christ and, and loves Jesus, but just hasn't really done anything with it yet, right? Would the Father cut off such a branch? No. No. 2 Peter 3.9 says, He is not willing that any should perish, any who are in Him. Jesus said the Father's desire is that all who are in Christ will produce fruit, bringing glory to the Father. And the Father receives no glory by, by cutting off branches that are in Christ. And if you, if you do a word study and you study these words, the, the Greek word, arei, it, it translates to cut off or, or being taken away. But it also has another meaning that means to be lifted up. And that's what the gardener does with these new branches. He lifts them up, giving them the support that they need, the training that they need in order that they might begin to produce fruit. And then Jesus altogether uses a different word in verse 6 when he talks about what happens to the vine that does not remain in him. Or to the branch that does not remain in him, sorry. Sorry. Now, left to ourselves, we all, we remain branches in Christ, but a lot of us 
by ourselves would probably stay fairly unfruitful, living in the dirt of the world, right? I mean, the, the life source of God is within us. God's Holy Spirit is in our lives. But God needs us to do more to make us to be fruitful. And to make us to be fruitful, what God does then is He lifts us up, He disciples us, He trains us in order that we might grow and produce fruit. And, and how does God do this? <coughs> Well, one of the ways, and the primary way in which God does this, that He lifts us up, is He places us in relationships with other believers. See, this is a spiritual truth that I know. We need other believers to help us grow effectively and to be fruitful. None of us can make it alone. Lone Ranger Christians, they really don't do well. I believe the single most important thing God does for us as he puts us in the context of other believers, including being part of a local church, a place where we can have a sharing and loving relationship with others, where we can come together and serve and grow and learn together with one another. Being with other Christians is vital to your spiritual health. And if we don't let God lift us up, then we're in danger of becoming fruitless, that, that, that fruitless branch that chooses not to remain in Christ. If we don't enter into relationships with other believers, if we don't apply His Word to our lives, if we don't let the Holy Spirit renew our minds, then we begin to cut off the flow of Christ's source of life. That source of life He places within us. Hebrews 3.12, it says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Don't miss that warning. These are branches that, that, that once thought they were connected to the vine of Christ, but they do not remain in Him. They're cutting themselves off from the source of life flowing from God. They, they, they live a life believing that they can find life maybe from some other vine. And the deceitfulness of sin ensnares them. If we turn away from Christ and do not remain in Him, then we have become, as it says, a, a withered, fruitless branch that will ultimately be thrown into the fire. And that is certainly not what we want. Now the second type of branch that it talks about is that branch that produces some fruit, right? Not all branches are as fruitful as others. Some branches have bushels full of fruit, right? While another branch might not have very much fruit at all. But don't confuse quantity and quality. If you are a believer, you are connected to the vine. The life of Christ, the vine, is what produces the fruit. And therefore, any fruit that is produced in your life out of obedience or, or discipling others and the fruits of the Spirit, whatever fruit may come is good fruit. Christ's life in you will not produce bad fruit. Christ is the, the true vine and only produces quality, the very best quality of fruit. However, each of us as branches, we can kind of restrict the quantity of fruit that's produced in our lives, right? We can squeeze that garden hose down to a trickle. Look at it again, what, what Jesus said in John 2, or John 15, 2 through 4. He says, Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you, Jesus says. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So what is it that restricts the production of the fruit? In one simple word, it's self. It's us. We love Christ. His Spirit is within us. And because of that, fruit should be evident in our lives. But the reality is, from time to time, more often for some of us than others, 
from time to time we begin to stop relying upon Christ in our lives. We, we begin to maybe live on our own strength, right? And Jesus said, no branch can bear fruit by itself. In those times when we as believers stop depending on Christ and we begin to rely upon our own strengths and our own abilities, it's then that our branches are unable to continue producing fruit. Oftentimes when this happens, we, 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 we may fall back into sin simply because we weren't depending upon Christ as a source of life to help us move forward in faith. So, so what then does the, the Father do for the branch that only produces some fruit? Does he cut it off and throw it away? No. The Father's desire is that each and every branch would produce an abundance of fruit. And that's not possible if you're cut off from the vine, right? What did Jesus say that the Father would do then? He says that each branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. What is, what is God doing when he prunes the branches? He's causing us to stop depending upon ourselves so that we might fully rely upon Christ to bear more fruit. Maybe you've noticed this. I've noticed this. Pruning is painful, right? But have you also noticed pruning is productive? I've noticed this as I've pruned shrubs and trees and things in my life. And I've noticed this spiritually as well. When the, when the branches are pruned back, more fruit is produced. It seems counterintuitive, but it works that way with flowers. It works that way with fruit, fruit trees. It works that way with bushes. When the branches are, are pruned back, more fruit is produced. The pain of cutting accomplishes what the Father intends. Fruitfulness. Hebrews 12 says this, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what son is not disciplined by his father? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it's actually painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by this pruning. So pruning is an important part of our life. Now the third category that I mentioned earlier of branches are those branches that produce an abundance of fruit, right? John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the source of life, and his life within you is for one purpose. That is that you would bear fruit. And we have to ask ourselves, are we connected to Christ? And if we are in Christ then, how much fruit is in our lives? Now these fruit branches that grow abundant fruit, these are branches that have been properly trained through the discipline of pruning. They have crucified to self. They have learned that apart from Christ they can do nothing. Galatians 2.20, right? I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives within me. The life I live in the body, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then as we heard from John earlier, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I mean, how, how can Jesus say that? Whatever you wish, right? How can Jesus say that? But you see, those branches that remain in Him and remain in His Word, they don't ask for things selfishly. They've died to self. They've died to the passions of this world and they live for Christ. Therefore, whatever they ask for is what Jesus would ask for. 
When we begin to mature as believers, when we begin to grow in our faith, it is then that, that we can bear an abundance of fruit. And as we grow in faith and grow in our fruit, God the Father is glorified in that as we show ourselves to be disciples of Christ. Jesus, the true vine, is always producing fruit in his branches. But the question is, how much fruit are you being willing and and allowing and letting to be produced in your life? Is there no fruit, some fruit, or an abundance of fruit? And what are you going to do if you fall into one of those first two categories? Let me wrap up with these thoughts. Maybe if you're, if you're honest, you, you find yourself wondering, am I a branch that produces no fruit? Maybe you've just kind of been that zombie Christian, right? You've just been going through the motions for so long that all you know now is just to go through the motions, right? Spiritually, there's just no heartbeat. You no longer have a passion for the things of God. And if that's you, let me both warn as well as encourage you. Scripture is clear about what happens to those who remain fruitless. It says they're cut off. And none of us want that to happen. I certainly don't want that to happen. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. Let's take some steps forward. Let's let's begin to serve others, right? Let's take some steps forward. Maybe join a Bible study. If you need some personal uh, discipling, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Kevin, talk to one of the mature Christians of this church. I would love to come alongside of you and help you grow. The very last thing we want is for dead branches just to be sitting here every Sunday. But it takes active participation by you. This won't happen without your involvement. Nobody can cause a branch to grow that doesn't want to grow. The branch has to do it itself, as well as with Jesus. If you find yourself feeling like you're one of those branches with no fruit, maybe today is the day to recommit yourself to faith. Maybe today is the day that you need to get honest with yourself, get honest with God on on what has been going on, on what has been holding you back. Maybe today is the day to commit yourself to take some positive steps to remedy that. There are all sorts of great opportunities and tools that we have. But you have to take that first step and get yourself started back on that path of faith. For the rest of us, my suspicion is each and every one of us have some things that need to be pruned. Most of us have things that we've been holding back spiritually. It could be that one friend, right? It could be that one habit. It could be that that fear that we have of what others think of us. It could be our things that we own, that own us. And even the good things in our lives can be pruned back by God if we let them get out of balance. If we let them get out of whack in our relationship with God the Father in heaven. Now here's the deal. If we see early on something that's going amiss, growing the wrong direction, right? If if we catch it early, that pruning is far less painful. But if we let parts of our lives grow in the wrong direction for too long, they start to get big. You ever pruned a little branch off a tree? Makes maybe a tiny little speck on it. When you've got to cut a big old branch off that tree, it scars it for life, doesn't it? And it takes much longer for that tree to heal from a big cutting. Those large cuttings can leave scars in our lives for the rest of our lives. And if there's something in your life right now that you know needs to be pruned, today is the day to do business with God. Don't delay. Don't let it keep growing. Don't let that pain become worse. Go after it so that you can get on with your spiritual life. Cut it out of your life before God has to. 
and then you really have to feel the pain. And for all of you who've really got this all figured out, right? Your life is a bumper crop. You're hitting on all spiritual cylinders, right? Your fruit is abundant. It's evident. It's everywhere in your life. Awesome. Keep on keeping on. Keep on doing it. Keep leading the way for the rest of us because we need somebody who's showing us the way. Don't let up. Keep at it until Jesus calls you home. And praise the Lord while you're in that season. So where are you today? Let's pray. Father God, we know that we're all over the map when it comes to these things, Lord. <clears throat> First God, I would pray for those who, who were just sitting there thinking they're connected to the vine, but there's no fruit, and it doesn't look like there will be any fruit in the future. God, I pray that in this moment you would convict those hearts, that you would make clear that that's not a good place to be, and that if we never produce fruit, then we'll be cut from the vine. Lord, I pray that that would not be the case for anyone, that they would mistake their relationship with you. And God, for those who are connected to the vine, but there's just not been any fruit, I pray in this moment, God, that that you would challenge them to take their faith seriously, to take that next step of faith, whatever that step might be, to do the things that are necessary to begin to grow. Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's Bible study, maybe it's just reading your word, finding themselves in, in fellowship with other believers. Maybe it's serving others and loving others. But God, begin to push them to begin to live out their faith, to get in the game, to begin to bear and yield fruit. And Lord God, for so many of us, the truth is, we're producing some fruit. But probably not optimal fruit. God, you've called us to live a life and a life abundant not just to wallow in mediocrity, not to settle, but abundant, joy-filled, passion-filled following of Christ. And God, that's many of us in this day. And Lord, I just pray that those things that have been keeping us, that we've been restricting that flow of the Spirit, that God, we would set those things free, that we would prune them out of our lives before you would have to prune them. God, pruning is painful, but it produces great fruit. And so God, I I pray that we would take this to heart seriously, the many of us who fall into that. And then, Father God, we rejoice for those who are producing abundant fruit. God, that is the goal. May we all produce abundant fruit. May we strive towards that. And as we produce abundant fruit, as we live in obedience, as we make disciples, as we have joy, peace, patience, and all the other things, God, may the world see that. May we bring you all glory, honor, and praise and make much of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you that you love us and that you continue to not abandon us, but chase after us. You won't leave us alone. So today, God, we come before you humbly, repenting of what's holding us back, praying, God, that you would free us and that today as we leave from here, we would go forth with the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world. That is the power you have put within us. May we take that seriously and bear fruit and bear fruit abundantly. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we have a prayer team who would love to pray with you. They'll be up here at the front. Come on up and pray with them before you head out. Otherwise, go forth and serve your king. God bless. Amen.